So welcome to the Dhammagiri Sunday program, everyone. So um, before we start our discussion, I thought I'd talk a little bit about some concepts that are very useful for meditators and basically anyone trying to s sort of control their minds. So in the Buddhist teaching, we have this concept of suttamaya panya, chintamaya panya, and bhavana maya panya. And so this word panya means wisdom. And then it's giving three different sources um, for our wisdom. And so the first is sutta. And sutta means to hear. And so in the Buddhist time, of course, people would actually come to a teacher and listen to the teacher. So they wouldn't read about things in a book. And that's why we have this word sutta. And so the second one is this chinta, chinta mayapanya. So this means thinking. So normally we're asked to, to listen to the teachings. And then we're supposed to think about them and reflect on them. We're supposed to recall them frequently. And then we're supposed to develop them. So this word bhavana means development, but we translate it as meditation because it's talking to a large extent about meditational development. So we have these three aspects. And so why, why do I bring it up? Well, we're going to do a little bit of this chintamaya panya. I'll give some sort of teachings you can think about. And then because with a group, it's not that easy to do your, the meditation side, right? You have to do that yourselves later. But we can bring up some teachings and then we can hear them and we can process them ourselves. Now, one of the concepts that is quite common or quite, you could say, fundamental to the Buddhist teaching is this word, ahara, in Pali, which means nutriment. And so um, the Buddha talks about various different kinds of qualities in our minds, and then he talks about what is the nutriment for that quality. So how do we, how do we nourish that quality? And so then he talks about the opposite. So in Pali, they, they use a negating particle. And so then ahara becomes anahara. So it has an an at the front. So they say something like literally non-nourishment, but we can say starving, the starving of the hindrances or the starving of the enlightenment factors. And now, when we are trying to understand about these qualities, first we have to try to understand what the qualities are. And so we can reflect on what the qualities are. And then we try to develop some and try to um, try to lessen others in our mind. And when we're doing that, we have to think about this ahara or anahara. So what kinds of factors are nourishing those qualities? Or which factors are leading to the decline of those qualities? And so in the Sangyutta Nikaya, there's some suttas in the Bojanga Sanyutta, and they're talking about this, how to starve the five hindrances and how to nourish the seven enlightenment factors. Um, so I'm not sure if everybody knows the five hindrances. Do we have some? I think my Sister Malika maybe knows the five hindrances. Do Can we, can someone list one of the hindrances? You can shout it out and I'll repeat it for, for everyone. Ill will. Ill will, okay. Sensual desire. Sensual desire, okay. Doubt, good, three. It's, yeah, can, yeah, that's a good question, actually, because some, some people say that uh, doubt it can, be, can block you from entering completely if you don't have some faith. And so we have which other ones, which other qualities are hindrances? Sloth and torpor. And now we're, we're down to one. Restlessness. So they, are one and a half, restlessness and remorse, we say, Udachakukucha. So we have our, our five hindrances. And as Gary said, maybe this, this one of doubt can be the strongest. In some cases, it can block us from actually starting. So the Buddha gives some similes for the hindrances. And actually, he gives a set of similes, one, a few sets of similes, but one of them are the water similes. And so for doubt, um, 
for Tao to the simile is you're trying to look in, at your reflection in a bowl of water and what happens to the water if someone has a lot of doubt? What kind of water are they looking at? No, not that one. <laughs> so it's sort of the water is hidden in a dark place. So it's like murky water and it, looking at it in the dark, you can't see anything. So that's the simile. So if you're trying to look at your reflection uh, in the water and you're your mind is filled with doubt, then you won't be able to... Um, to develop your path to practice. And so um, we'll give the five similes, then we'll talk about the different factors that are sort of nourishing these qualities and that are uh, leading to the, their reduction. So what's the next water simile? Well, we won't do it in order because we're already starting from the reverse side. Boiling water is ill will. So you're looking at your face in boiling water and so everything that you're seeing in this water is completely distorted, completely distorted. And then, so three more similes. What about restlessness? What kind of water is restless? I think, yes, now, you can, now we come to that one. So the water that's all whipped up by the wind, sort of a lot of waves and sort of turbulent water. This kind of water also, if you look at your face in it, you won't see a clear reflection. Okay, now we're down to two more. So one for sensual desire and one for sloth and for, for laziness and sleepiness. So of poison. Okay, so we have, I'll just repeat for the, the online video viewers. So we had a suggestion, not, not a guest from the sutta, but a suggestion that um, the sensual desires could be like a, something that's sort of poisonous, the vapors are causing us harm. And so this kind of simile is seen in some other suttas, like the simile of honey on the tip of a, of a blade, like this kind of thing. But in this particular sutta, we're talking about different simile. And so we have, actually, we have a similar analogy in English. If you, if somebody is overly optimistic, we say that they are looking at the world through rose-colored glasses, right? So similarly, then if we're looking at our face in, in a bowl of water that's been dyed a green or a yellow or blue, we can't see the actual color of the ref in the reflection. I think no one... The last one's a little, it was more difficult to guess. So for the sleepiness and laziness, it, the simile is water that is covered over by moss. <laughs> it's grown over by moss. So we don't see anything when we're very sleepy. Now, the significance that the Buddha says with these similes is that when our mind is overcome by one of these hindrances, we don't know a few things. So we don't know what's for our benefit. We don't know what's for someone else's benefit, right? And we don't know what's for the benefit of both. So we, we can't actually analyze the situation uh, in a clear way when our mind is overcome by these hindrances. And so then the Buddha is, the Buddha gives us, uh, like, gives us these instructions on uh, how to reduce them in various places. So. Maybe we'll get some uh, suggestions how we reduce the hindrances, and then I'll give some principles. We'll try to systematize like how the Buddha is teaching this, because he, uh, he actually gives us sort of groupings of how he does this. So how can we reduce anger or sensual desire? Yeah, so that's, the, that's right, yeah, so the... So the, the Sister Malika has given away the game here. So, they, so the principle is yoni so manasikara, or wise attention. Uh, but I think that we need to unpack that term a little bit. It's not that simple to understand without some concrete examples. So maybe we'll get some concrete examples how people might reduce anger or desire or doubt. Okay, that's, that's fine. So when we were talking earlier about 
the nourishment and then the starving of these qualities. And so the Buddha has given nourish sort of some hints on how we can do this. And so especially the method is this Yoniso Manasikara, so to pay attention to particular aspects of the object. And then we have to be sensitive to which, paying attention to which aspects leads to which result. And so going back to um, the suggestion that doubt can come first, when we have when we have too much doubt, then we're paying attention to to uh, an object or some kind of concept in a way that leads us to sort of turn it over and over again in our minds, um, flipping back and forth without coming to a resolution. So normally when we talk about doubt, we're talking about the kinds of doubt that lead us, to, like that prevent us from practicing the Buddha's Dhamma, that prevent us from meditating uh, and doing good deeds and things like this. But we can also have similar kinds of doubt in our life about what kind of decisions to make and then the mind can get trapped in these circles, sort of um, flopping back and forth between two options. And so, um, so the Buddha recommends that we see what, we, ha we kind of have to investigate what kind of way of thinking about that is leading to, leading to the doubt. And then we have to try to break out of it. So some practical examples. Uh, one thing we can do is sometimes we can set things aside for a while. So you can think of maybe like an author who has writer's block. And then sometimes they can spend a whole year. They can't, they can't figure out what they're going to write next. And then they decide, ah, I'm going to surface paradise for, for three months and I'm just going to lie on the beach. So then, or they decide I'm going to volunteer for uh, UNICEF in Somalia and I'm going to give up my job. And then sometimes later by, by sort of changing their focus, then they're naturally able to sort of resolve the issue. And so another source of wisdom that can help us resolve doubts is this uh, Kalyanamittata, so noble friendship, right? Spiritual friendship. So if we have somebody we can trust or a group of people, we, we trust their Dhamma knowledge, their experience in life, then we can, we can meet with them, we can discuss things. And sometimes if they don't have a solution, but they may have some, some kind of uh, advice to help you find a solution, or maybe they know some sutta you can read to, that might have some useful information. So then we, we're going up, we go to Udacha Kukucha. Then we come to restlessness and remorse. So somebody who's suffering from this one, they can suffer a lot. Um, some people have a lot of pain from their past. And then when they sit down to meditate, they just keep churning it up again and again. And this is, I think in our society, it's very strong. I think one reason, possibly because we have a lot of records of what we've done in the past. So we have a lot of photo albums and we have Facebook and we have videos of ourselves from the past, whereas 2000 years ago, maybe the memories would fade a little bit more. But for whatever reason, people, people have trouble with this. So what's one way to, to deal with it? Go ahead, Stefan. Um, so the question is about this restlessness and remorse and whether they're always linked together and whether there, or whether there are two types, one type that is more like I was just describing where somebody is, has some sort of, some sort of grief or remorse over something that they're churning over and one more innocuous kind where they just feel sort of restlessness. They don't sort of feel comfortable sitting still or they, they're just not settled, but they don't have a deeper cause so it's a good point and it's true there so there are these two aspects of it and so we can have different causes for restlessness and it can be as simple as uh, it can be as simple as you you ate the wrong breakfast you had too many bran flakes for breakfast they're not it's not digesting or you're not used to eating meat and then you had a big big piece of fish or something you can't digest it this can lead also to a certain amount of restlessness and there are hindrances to our meditation but uh, 
typically the the more profound problem the one that people need more advice about is the other kind of restlessness and remorse where they're remembering things um, and so this one is difficult I don't think there's one only one uh, aspect to it but so coming back to this theme of wise attention yoniso manisakara that the Buddha is advising us to apply um, one one way to do it is to look at the broader circumstance of your life or of of that time period. So some people, they have a lot of regret about how they treated their parents when they were children. They, did, they weren't respectful for their parents, especially if their parents maybe passed away when they were young. They, they can have this kind of regret. And so in, in this sort of case, one thing is just to, re to reflect on the nature of childhood. So, I mean, we all wish that we sort of had had the whole life's worth of wisdom from the age of seven or eight years old, but if you if you work with children, then you know that a seven or eight year old, they view the world in a very different way than we do. And then as we as we age, those memories sort of we almost imagine like we had all of the options that we have now. And like now maybe you can speak six languages and you have you have different kinds of degrees and you have a job and you're and you have your own children, but when you were eight years old, you were just struggling to, sort of your, your parents were struggling to make you go to school each day. And so it was just a completely different life. And so if you think about the context, then sometimes you can, uh, by this understanding, it can help to reduce some of this remorse. If it's not in that case, like sometimes the memory is not so far back, but then we can look at the course of the whole life span. So then we can we can think about all of the things that are happening in our life, and so we can contemplate. Well, what did I do this week? And sort of back, what did I do last year? And then, sort of, what will I do in the future? Imagine I live to the age of eighty, and you can sort of contemplate like the whole lifespan of eighty years, and put it in the context. Then, yes, I I made some mistake at that point, but at other points in my life, I also did good things. And like no one is able to always make the correct decision. So um, we're, we're applying this as a strategy to reduce the grief. So if you find you're, you're doing this and it's not working and a grief gets stronger, you're thinking this is foolish, it's useless, then in that case, it's not the right method for you, right? This is a practical method um, that we're trying to actually reduce these kinds of hindrances. So we have, I'm sure there are more methods. If, but no one, no one seems to be suggesting, so maybe we'll move on to the next hindrance. So. so when we come to the laziness and and sleepiness, so then again we have two aspects. So the one is simply la simply sleepiness, which is less problematic unless you have some kind of physical disorder. And so it often can have just a simple problem like simple cause could be the weather could be not enough sleep the night before uh, the laziness can come from a sense of complacency sometimes it can come from a discouragement then sometimes we feel that we've been practicing meditation for a long time and it hasn't sort of come up enough um, so typically we have well I open the, the floor, how do we overcome laziness? Does someone have a suggestion? Uh, energy to investigate? Sure, yeah, you can increase the you can investigation power. Investigate mind and, w investigate what object? Uh, okay, sure, sure. So whatever your meditation object is, you can apply more investigation and less simple concentration. So this is one, this is a very valid method. Another one is to, uh, oh, one, another. You can do just to concentrate on Okay, so if you don't feel like sitting meditation, you can get up and do walking. So this works, uh, I think, yes, yeah, so this can build energy. Uh, so we can change our postures as well. Um, so one way is to do it through faith also. 
so some people if you're from a buddhist background then maybe you like to offer flowers i see some people like to offer flowers and candles to the buddha rupa and for them these kind of things bring up faith and energy if you're not from a buddhist background it, they might not so it depends on the character you have to sort of know yourself so the one side is to try to bring up faith um, by in that way is one way but we can contemplate the buddha's qualities or we can read some stories about the buddha or some kind of um arahants or monks who've practiced hard nuns who've practiced very well in the past and then the other side is to develop this sense of urgency and then to contemplate uh, to contemplate this death and then in one place the buddha has given some instructions about counting down our lifespan how many how many seasons we have how many years we have how many weeks we have how many days how many meals how many breaths all these things he's and then we can contemplate the uh, uncertainty of life. This one is suitable. Uh, you have to check if it's suitable for you. So we're trying to bring down the hindrances. If you start to get some kind of uh, negative reaction, then it's not the right method for you. So that's three. Three down is pretty good. You know, two more. So for anger, anger. Yeah, sure. So if you can, we can develop metta or loving kindness meditation. Usually we have to do that before. If you haven't done it yet and someone comes up to give you a whack, then it's probably too late to start trying. So th there should be a lot of strategies because I think everyone here has been angry at some point. We all have strategies. Can take time off. That's true. Yeah. So, so to take some time away from to to, to withdraw yourself from the situation. So, if you feel like your, um, maybe your boss is blame you for something and you're really angry with your boss you're going to tell her what you think about her then maybe better not to tell her that then you, you can wait till the next day you can make a better plan this is what the buddha said when we're we have these hindrances in our mind we don't know what's for our benefit and what's for somebody else's benefit so because of this we we can't act in a very um, sort of useful way two people angry is, is worse than one person angry right it's it's worse yeah we also have other tricks so some of these some things can be almost like um if you think about a boxing match then we say you cannot hit below the belt for a boxing match but when you're fighting the hindrances it's okay to hit below the belt because you're trying to win at all costs so you can use some tricks some people find they know that uh, they feel more calm if they go for a jog. They do some kind of physical activity. Or they just, they like to drink uh, black tea or something like that. So you can change any kind of activity. Essentially, any kind of harmless activity that's replacing the anger is, is in that case, is going to be beneficial for you. Even there was one, one study that was dealing with fear and it was dealing with people who had developed this post-traumatic stress disorder from, from combat. And the study had asked them to do a task that maybe some of you have done in the past, and that is to play Tetris. So every day they had to play Tetris for 30 minutes or one hour. So some of you may be too, uh, they, too young to remember Tetris. I don't know if it's still popular, but... Um, anyway, so it's this, so they would they had them play Tetris for I don't know it was a long time like thirty minutes or an hour a day for a number of months and then afterwards they did a brain scan and then they had found changes in their limbic system their, their emotion emotional system and they'd also found changes in the amount of fear and so they were able to treat these sort of traumatic memories by by playing a video game so 
I mean, normally monks don't recommend people to play video games. It's not sort of a common meditation instruction. But if you're able to do something that's quite harmless and able to remove this kind of sort of harmful intention from your mind, then do we have to consider, as I say, hitting below the belt with the hindrances is okay. And then we come to uh, sensual desire. Um, so usually, this one we, the Yoniso Manasikara, the Buddha says we should pay attention to the uh, asubhanimata, which means the unpleasant aspect of things. So whatever object we're attracted to, we can we can pay attention to uh, some aspect of it that we don't like for for whatever reason. And so there's actually a sutta that there's some suttas where the Buddha talks about this ability that the arahants have, the ability to see a beautiful thing as an ugly thing and to see an ugly thing as a beautiful thing uh, and that they have mastered this ability uh, in order to maintain their minds equanimously. So um, sometimes one another way to deal with some kind of strong desire. So sometimes it can be a habit. Um, it can be so, like sometimes, for example, somebody likes to go. They like to go and play. Um, th they like to go and play blackjack at the casino or something. It might not necessarily be like a strong gambling addiction, but they want to cut down on that. Then they can reflect on the negative, uh, like outcomes from that, the negative effect it has on their lives. So again, we can recontextualize it by thinking about um, the effects it has on a, long, a longer scale. So if it's something really harmful, we can think about the bad karma that's involved. If it's something just that we like to change in our lives, that we'd like to reduce, then we can just reflect on what kind of effects that it's having, having on our life. Um, so we have these, for the hindrances, we have the different kinds of uh, non-nourishment or starving of the hindrances, then the Buddha also gives the ways to nourish our good qualities. And again, a lot of it is this uh, wise attention. But I think maybe maybe we'll just end this part of the discussion there and see if anyone has any other topics they'd like to discuss or any kind of questions. Okay, so this is a, uh, so the problem that that was just raised is that some people when they meditate, then they their mind they start to feel very calm, and then they fall asleep, and then when they wake up they feel refreshed, and then they think, oh my meditation is really developing. I have some kind of special samadhi, samadhi. Um, so yeah, this is a real problem, um, and so normally the way to overcome this is to have a friend hit you over the head <laughs> while you're while you're meditating not with a not with their fist but with like a with a piece of cloth or something you can take just like a rag and or to drip some water on your head actually the important thing is because when people get into this trap they can really they really be hard to snap them out of it so i know one person one person had this problem and every day he was meditating and he is falling asleep. But then he is telling his teacher, oh, his meditation is very good. And then the other meditators are looking, when they hear the, the explaining this, they're looking, you're sleeping all day. Then you say your meditation is good. But he wouldn't believe the situation. So what they finally did was they, they had to, to take some photos. And they brought, they brought him the photos as evidence, you know, you're sleeping in your meditation. I think not everyone will be that. I think for most people, this this only happens time to time. But if someone really gets into this situation for a longer time, sometimes they need some 
someone to help them snap out of it. But they have to trust you, right? If they don't want you to snap them out of it, then don't, <laughs> you know, don't, don't bother them. I'm sorry? Mara. Kile Samara. Uh, yeah, we can say that. So, in. Does everyone know the meaning of Kile Samara? So, Kilesa is impurities, yeah. Um, so, Mara, we know who Mara is, do we? He's the the one who who sort of uh, is like the, a kind of celestial being who prefers us to just enjoy our lives and waste our time kind of thing and encourages us to develop the all, the opposite qualities that the Buddha wants us to develop. And so, but then the commentaries are analyzing because in, if you read the suttas, sometimes it seems like Mara is a, a being, like some kind of a, some kind of a demigod or something who comes down. But in some cases, it seems like Mara is just your your own internal voice. And so that's why the commentaries say sometimes Mara is a being and sometimes it's yourself. And so this Kalesa Mara, Kalesa means um, it's defilements. And so then, uh, that, that, so that's the meaning of Kalesa Mara. So, so yeah, I guess you can say it's a kind of Kalesa Mara. When, when people are falling asleep and they think it's samadhi, that kind of thing. Go ahead. Right. Okay, so um, the first the first one that you mentioned was about when somebody is falling asleep when they meditate. And it might be that their mind is trying to avoid thinking about the Dhamma practice that they need to do. Is that correct? Um, so this is this is also possible. So uh, of course, our mental states can cause some kind of physical states in our body, and they can affect. So th so it is possible uh, that that in some cases this this can be the problem. If if that's the case, it's a very it's not that easy to cure this sort of situation. Um, I think that kind of meditator needs some help from a teacher over a longer period to overcome that. Uh, the other issue is, um, so the other issue, I'll try to summarize. So um, when we're living our lives, then we can't go around having absolutely certainty, absolute certainty about everything. Uh, and then if we want to make, if we want to make decisions, we want to understand things, then we have to have a certain amount of of skepticism towards it in order to spur on an investigation and deeper understanding of it. Is that a, a, sort of, so that's sort of the general situation. And so th then this is, um, so when we're talking about, I think this kind of question comes often um, because the Western philosophical systems have a little different use of terminology than like the Indian, sort of Indian analysis. So what we would call something like a healthy skepticism or some, or this certain kind of, this kind of doubt about things uh, in maybe Western perspective would c probably come under investigation in the, on, in the Buddhist system. So then when we talk about this Vimangsa, uh, we talk about, um, investigating things or under uh, Dhamma Vichya Sambo Janga is also investigation of states. And so uh, when we, okay, so that's the first part, but I, then what to do about the situation is uh, is not at all clear. <laughs> so just to know that. So, so actually the first thing then is to understand this doubt that the Buddha is talking about here is especially things that are uh, specifically blocking us from trying in our Dhamma practice. And so that means that we have to have a certain amount of faith in the Dhamma practice uh, before even, be, in a way, before this hindrance will even come up. And that is to say that if we look in the analysis of the Noble Eightfold Path, the sister, 
the Arahanta Dhammadina, the Chula Vedala Sutta, she's explaining that the wisdom aspect of the path is actually the Samaditti Samasankhapa. So the first sort of two factors of the path, so right view and right uh, intention. I think those are the common translations. So this is actually the the wisdom part of the path, and and but it's actually the, also the entry point. And so before we really start our Dhamma practice, earlier I was talking about this chintamaya panya, so the, the wisdom that comes from thinking about things. So we actually have to read some Dhamma, and then we have to analyze for ourselves a little bit to, to understand that is it, is it the case that our actions have some kind of results, uh, some kind of ethical quality to our actions? So maybe you won't, maybe you'll still have some skepticism towards rebirth or something, but you can see, for example, that somebody who's always angry and somebody who's always lying and, and uh, maybe they, they like to give false lawsuits or something like that, then this kind of person even we even if we don't know about future lives but we can see that they may seem to be getting a lot of money but the people around them don't like them right there's a different kind of cost to that kind of behavior and so uh, through this kind of we can say reasoned analysis and then through then we have to develop a certain amount of faith and then once we've got to a, a certain amount of faith then we have to take like uh, at some point we have to essentially commit to that and say, okay, now I've already analyzed that. And then as far as I can tell, this seems to be the case. Maybe later I can go back and look at it again. But for now, I'm going to take this as like a, a guiding principle. And if we don't do this, then sort of we get sort of trapped in this, this cycle of uh, skeptical thinking. And especially for meditators nowadays, like I said earlier, this word sutta means hearing. And so in the past, you would go to a teacher, you would request some kind of teaching, and then essentially you'd have to try to practice it to find out about it. But now you go to YouTube and you see what they're teaching, and then you search reviews of so-and-so and see what the results are. <laughs> then, and so then we're kind of, it's a different process. And obviously not everyone is doing this, but it's the kind of trap that some people fall into with this doubt. And so then they, not only with Dhamma things, they find like, some kind of products or something, then they, they want to buy something, then they start looking at reviews, oh, maybe this one's better, uh, maybe this one's no good. And so at some point we have to decide the kind of meditation is enough that we can trust it, to practice it for now. The teacher that we're with and the community we're with, uh, maybe we can't say they're practicing perfectly the way the Buddha did, but it's enough to trust them for now. And so then we have sort of stepping stones on our path. So it's a very uh, good question, uh, important question to, for us. Yeah, so this is the, the, the question, the suggestion is maybe we can fake it till we make it and work on the other hindrances until the doubt disappears. So this, this is uh, yes, it's a very valid way, uh, way of practicing. Um, one way to look at it is from. There's a teaching called Vitaka Santana Sutta, and it gives five ways to reduce our negative, negative thinking, and one of the ways is simply to change your object, so you can focus on your breath instead of focusing on your um, the parts of the body or something. And try another way that it gives is just to ignore the hindrances. So you can just ignore the doubt. Uh, according to the Abhidhamma system, if we have some kind of a good quality in our mind, that time it sort of it's it will sort of push out the negative quality. So in this kind of teaching, even if you're just focusing on your breath, if your concentration starts to come up, then the doubt won't be there. <laughs> so. And people can experience this if their if their meditation is picking up. All of a sudden, these doubts disappear. That like, where did they go? All, all of a sudden, they're gone. Um, so, for experienced practitioners, I think this is a good method. For beginners, it might be difficult. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the suggestion is if we have strong faith, then we can simply put down the doubt. So this is true, but actually um, the Buddha mentions that we should balance our faith faculty with our investigation faculty, this vimangsa. And so you can see um, the, danger, the danger now if you sort of just set aside, set aside all of the doubt Sort of, we won't say set aside the doubt. If you set aside any kind of investigation of things, then uh, you can sort of be taken in. Somebody can sort of slip, slip some sort of logical fallacy in there, then sort of lead you on the wrong path. Great. So we have another suggestion how to deal with sleepiness. And this one has been borrowed from one Ajahn, one unnamed Ajahn. So he, and, uh, and so the suggestion is that when somebody has too much thinking in daily life, then they're always planning. They have so many things on the go. And when they sit down to meditate, when, then the mind thinks it's time to sleep. And it, because it's, it's used to having something being processed all the time. Um, so more of a suggestion, maybe that people can change their habits in life. And, um, and of course, as we said, with the hindrances, you can hit below the belt like this. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so we have a credit. Credit goes to Ajahn Jayasaro for that, that technique. Okay, so the question is about sometimes this meditator feels uh, some agitation or sort of a bit uh, excited after meditating. And so I think there are two issues. The one is the one is some people have different reactions to meditation. And so then if the mind isn't becoming calm and we find that the hindrances are increasing during the meditation, it's very helpful to discuss with somebody about it because there can be there can be quite a variety of causes for that. Um, as I said earlier, some sometimes the physical situation can affect our mind, um, and then but there can be other reasons, uh, many many other reasons. So in this case, we have a suggestion. It can be coming from a certain meditation method, like thinking about who am I and who was I before my parents were born or something like that so the buddha actually doesn't recommend we meditate that way there's some suttas where he says that this will just lead to further thinking so if we are meditating on on these things we can't actually resolve these kinds of questions and so the buddha recommends we focus on uh, the, actually he gives a, a lot of different things we can focus on but essentially we're trying to i for the most part, we're trying to develop some good qualities of mind, sort of our, our concentration, our wisdom, and we're trying to lower, re reduce these hindrances. And so then later we can sort of cycle back and we can develop our wisdom more, so by a more direct investigation. So if you want to know like about, um, 
about comma, how comma works, then we can't just think about it. Then you have to develop the concentration and the investigation sort of according to the different processes of dependent origination. So it's not sort of a simple thing. Um, so maybe if you try just focusing on the breath or have you done some kind of meditation with with like uh, qigong or some other system before? Yeah, so so I'm not I, I know about this, but I haven't studied Zen Buddhism. So just to calm as f as far as Theravada Buddhism goes, like to calm the mind, one way is to pay attention to your posture, to pay attention to the shape of your body as you're sitting, and then from there, if if your body starts to relax and become calm, then you can start focusing on the breath a little bit. And once you have some kind of basis of just ability to stay mindful and calm, after that, then the Buddha has given many, many different ways to meditate. But I think the first step would be to just get that sense of comfort in the body, comfort in the mind, and then can take a step further. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a good. That's a very good point. So, the point is that some people are using white noise to sort of, um, we can say, not drown out, but lessen the impact of the uh, sort of loud sounds that are going on around them. And then, is there some sort of equivalent for the in, that we can do internally? And then the suggestion is like Om meditation that they do in in some Hindu traditions. This might be something like that. Uh, so actually, there have there has been research about this Om mantra, and they found that people who are doing this sort of Om chanting get some kind of get some kind of results. They, their mind becomes calmer. Their emotions aren't as sharply they're sharply reactive as they were before from and they, they can do some they can see some changes in the brain however as a buddhist monk i, I don't I cannot recommend doing hindu mantras but anyway but we can understand that the sound thing does have a, an impact and so um so i guess you could try just normal from something that we would do in theravada would be a more normal chanting so it's quite popular for people to chant uh, ratana sutta um a lot of people find that their mind becomes quite calm through through doing some some of the paritta chanting before they meditate um, and also we can do some internal we can do some internal sounds so we do this uh, buddhanasati rec recollecting the qualities of the buddha and so for people who have a real hard time settling their mind we recommend they do this buddhanasati very fast like like that. Or or they can do it like and so people will do that for hours. I I mean I understand that most of you won't want to do that, but you just to validate your point that there are ways of many ways of doing that as some of them are not necessarily that we're teaching some that we are and uh, i was joking about the om thing if you want to chant om it's okay it's, it's just a joke
to, to, to do the Budo. Yeah, so Ajahn Chah's tradition, the comment is they do Budo. Um, so with the Budo practice, um, s people do it different ways. So some people do it with the breath, like Budo. And some people do it very fast, Budo, 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 Budo. But so, like the experience that I've seen, and that we're talking internally, not ex not out loud. So the experience that that I've seen with meditators in Sri Lanka is the people tend to find it easier to go through the nine qualities of the Buddha quickly for the quick version. And then when their mind becomes calmer to switch to the Buddha type of thing, to choose just one quality of the Buddha. So once their mind has already become calm, then they can develop the concentration more. But you're welcome to try any method and see if it works for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Some revi revision of, of Mahamogalana, Venerable Mahamogalana's trouble with sleepiness, and then the different ways. So you mentioned the Buddha recommended when he was feeling sleepy, he could pull his ears or rub his ears. And then what else did he recommend? Open your eyes and look at the light. Okay, open the eyes and look at light. And, and what other things? Change the object of meditation. I don't remember actually all of the methods. Now there are five, are there? One of them is splashing the water face with water. One is to stand up and walk, and change the object. Is that the fifth? Okay. So these are the, the these are the traditional suggestions for overcoming drowsiness. But um, I I think this is for normal sleepiness. <laughs> Like the, the cases we were talking about earlier where somebody is falling asleep, they believe they're in deep meditative state. This is a bit more complicated. We need more stronger intervention there. Okay, so... Um, so this is for a question about how to meditate for beginners. So usually um, this is, depends on the character of the meditator. So usually if somebody, we prefer that like in, in our monastery that, that people will learn like a few different types of meditation. But for somebody who doesn't have access to a teacher and they're, they're practicing alone at home, then one way is to, to start with the breathing meditation. But because it's not that easy at first to focus on the breath only, then there's one section of the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha is talking about mindfulness of postures. And so he talks about being mindful when we're standing or sitting, and, and then also when we're moving, walking and reaching out. And so we can start by just paying attention to the shape of our body. And so our body, um, just it, we'll, we'll talk in a simple way, we have certain qualities like the body is heavy, right? It has some kind of heaviness to it. And it's, it's sort of being pulled together. The skin is sort of holding it together. The bones are holding it all up. And so when you're sort of standing there, you can feel, you can sort of feel that like the softer parts of your body are sort of being pulled down by gravity, the harder parts kind of holding it up and sort of just feel what the body is like in that posture. And when you sit, if you do this while you're walking um, or standing for a while, then your mind will start to, to get into the meditation sort of zone. Then you feel more like meditating. And then you might want to sit down and you can pay attention to the posture while you're sitting down. You can even experiment with your hands a little bit and see like, is, are you more comfortable here? Are you more comfortable here? You see what kind of effect it has on your mind because for, for meditation, of course, uh, it's it's essential that the body be comfortable if you're, I mean, assuming you're not ill <laughs> or something like that, but it, it's essential to try to make your body as comfortable as possible. But the main goal is to train our mind to, to be able to overcome difficulties. So so once we 
have found a posture that we feel comfortable in, we can focus on the breath. And usually in our tradition, we focus on sort of this area around the, the nostrils. And it's not necessary to focus like very fiercely at one point exactly, as long as you can feel the breath coming in and out there. And some people have trouble with this. And there are some tricks if you can't feel the breath clearly. Some people use like a, they have these diffusers. And if you have a peppermint oil diffuser, <laughs> it actually, this is a, not my invention. One, one of our teachers, is, I heard it in one of his talks, he recommended somebody couldn't feel the breath, they could put peppermint oil here. And then later I, I saw somebody had a diffuser, which is I think much more reasonable than just applying it to you. So, um, and then you can just focus on the breathing in and out. And if the, if the mind starts to think, and as we know, minds think, that's what they're, that's what they're there for. Um, so don't worry about it. So when your mind is thinking, you can bring it back to the breathing. Uh, the, the danger is only certain kind of thoughts. So then we were talking today about the five kinds of hindrances, the five kinds of negative thoughts. And so when these come in, then we either, we either if they keep getting stronger, then we have to do some other technique to reduce them. But if they're getting weaker just by focusing on the breath, then there's no need to do another thing. So I think somebody just starting out for meditation, that should uh, get you quite far. <laughs> if you can do that, then you're doing quite well. Okay, well, it looks like we've, we're all running out of voice today. We've, we've talked, talked to you all out. So thank you so much for coming this Sunday at Damagiri. And so we hope that you may all be a happy, healthy, peaceful, and content, and swiftly attain the peace of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.